thank you for being here, ladies and gentlemen. As you can see, I wanted to look at a, fundamentally the question of, ultimately, who makes the decision. We've heard a lot today about various aspects of the IoT and about gaining value and about using AI and cognitive computing and so on. But as part of my role in looking at uh, teaching my students uh, governance at, alongside analytics, we have to think about how these things go. And this is based on a whole lot of research that my students did over the last year or so, uh, and summarized in some articles that they've written for their final uh, semester. And I'm summarizing some of the stuff about the opportunities, and we'll get there. So I want to look at a governance framework, a governance perspective, which helps us to look at some of the critical and important consequences uh, when we think about that question of who or what is making the decision. I'm coming back as someone else looked at Moore's Law, but not Moore's Law for computing, the hardware, but Moore's Law for data. Data is now growing so fast, exponentially, doubling every 18 months or so. I want to bring in another interesting issue that comes from IBM, from a research at IBM, a chap called John Easton, who pointed out four years ago that something like 80% of all the data around us is of uncertain veracity. Not that it's all wrong, but we find it incredibly difficult to identify the data which is correct the data which is incorrect, and by how much it is incorrect. We're looking at a concept, uh, context um, of the rapid, incredibly rapid growth of connected sensors, whether it's Fitbits, attached to ourselves, things in here that count the number of steps, the number of flights you've gone upstairs, or whatever, but on machine tools, in aircraft, on lorries, on cars, Everything is becoming connected at an incredible rate. The projections for 2020 are in the, the billions, and perhaps an order or two of magnitude and more devices connected than there are humans on this earth. We talked a little bit about connecting to um, social media for gaining insights. Slight problem, how do you know that the richest self on Twitter or richest self on LinkedIn is the richest self who's got your account? Uh, business in the UK, um, asked for a little bit of help recently when they discovered that they had something like a hundred million different registrations on their customer uh, database for UK. This was slightly problematic, but that's more than there are people in the UK, including babies and children. And they found out they've got about six registrations for every single person registered as a customer. The context also includes the fact that we're now looking more and more at trying to get our analytics to make decisions for us. Whether it's the Google car deciding where to go, or whether it's your predictive analytics suggesting new contacts, those aliens. And then we heard two terms today as well. Big data and small data. I want to bring in a little thought there about the value of small data alongside big data. And the final thing which will affect many of us here, all of us, those of us who are in, the, in Europe, changing uh, field of GDPR. It's going to change an awful lot for many of us. Now this was a set of questions I set the students. They were to look at big data driven analytics decision making, looking at all sorts of different aspects, whether it's the opportunities, challenges, benefits, operations, the list is there. It covers a whole range of areas that can help us to get great value. But also, if we're not careful, we can fall into some very, very nasty traps. A little summary, 26 students this year, two capstone related modules and hit those were the questions and we'll be publishing the top 20 uh, e-publishing fairly shortly subject to getting um, a volunteer to do the editing for me
just so that they know that they've been there, but these are the names of all the students who have contributed value and thoughts to what I'm going to tell you very shortly. Um, you'll better get these presentation, the, the presentation shortly, so you can actually get those names, this page and the next page, of the actual topics that will be published very shortly. Um, now, the insights, this is where it gets interesting. Yes, there are many, many use cases, and we've heard some today, which say, yes, we can get great value for our businesses. However, and we were talking a little bit about sentiment analysis connected to uh, different company profiles you know, a couple of presentations back. One of the interesting issues that comes out of all of this thing called big data is that many people think we don't need to worry any longer about causality. We can get it go away from the old scientific paradigm, correlation, then working out the causation. And we don't need to worry about designing the experiment to collect our data um, with proper sampling. Because we have data, n equals all. We've got all the samples we need. But you go and talk, get some small data from your friends who are running small restaurants there and say, what's the sentiment analysis on your Twitter feed or on your Facebook? And they'll tell you, well, there's not very much. And 99% of it is, this is a rubbish restaurant to go to. Because the people who are tweeting or Facebooking or on many of these um, types of environments are those who are unhappy. Those of us who are happy, we've got the expected service. Can we be bothered to tweet or go to Facebook or whatever? human nature folks. But we also know, not only is it in the internet-based data, it's also our own corporate data. Have any of you done an ERP implementation in the last 10, 15 years? You switch from your legacy system to SAP and you cull 70% of your master data as being irrelevant, unnecessary. So you can end up with a clean implementation. Now the funny thing is, because of what someone else said today about SAP, you have to fudge it to get the data in here, you've got to record something slightly out of kilter here to get it in. Within 10 years, that data in your master data and all the rest of SAP is now fundamentally dirty in ways that you do not know how to collect or to correct. You then need to do another big data cleansing, so don't believe our master data is correct and completely clean. It isn't. So veracity is a huge problem if we're going to let things make their own decisions. We need to go back to that little data, the human nature of data, the interviews, the discussions, to find out what the real explanation is. Because everything we've talked about today here all the people out there in these stands, almost everything is based on statistical analysis other than neural network AI type of thing. We'll come back to that in a minute. And too many people make a, uh, forget the difference between correlation and causation. Correlation is just things happen in the, at the same way at the same time. Causation is this causes that. And that is fundamentally what you need if you're going to make really valuable decisions, if you're going to gain value for your company. And as I said, GDPR, the data protection regime, is interesting in its own right in the UK today. It's going to get much more exciting when the European GDPR comes into effect very, very soon. Out of all the work that the, my students did, and it even includes things like Google Car, because that's a machine making some decisions. Today, broadly, Google Cars require staggeringly accurate maps to be um, generated. Before they can go into Phoenix to do some hot weather testing this summer, Google sent four or five cars, their special mapping cars to map every road very accurately, where the, and where the curves were and how high they were, where all the marks the 
uh, white lines were to extreme accuracy before they can let Google cars go and do their thing. This implies fairly deterministic mechanism inside the way that Google Car is working. Whilst Google Car is using deterministic te um, technology, i.e. formula which we build into it, yes, we can claim it's going to be safer than humans, because it won't make mistakes often. But we've all had the blue screen on our PCs, our mobile phones, even Apple ones freeze every now and then or go slow. It's going to be rather embarrassing if a machine says, I give up, here's your blue screen, and you're doing 70 mile an hour in the middle of the motorway. It's going to be really quite exciting, especially if you have got a steering wheel. We also know that in aircraft, at least one aircraft has crashed, effectively because the computers, all five of them, said, I give up, I've no idea what's going on. That was Air France. Uh, aircraft that fell into the uh, Atlantic. The computers gave up and there was no way for humans to override the computers or to fly the aircraft. That's kind of interesting. So read The Glass Cage by Nick Carr. He's a really interesting writer. And that, that's written, it's called The Glass Cage or Why We Don't Need Humans. And it's a looking at industry, at design, it's looking at the way that we're using computer-aided design in all sorts of environments in terms of architecture, creativity. And it comes up with really interesting things. Someone mentioned, we talked about Watson um, Cognitive that won Jeopardy in 2011. We now have Watson Oncology, which is designed to advise experts in cancer um, uh, treatment, it will advise them based on the latest uh, articles that it's read, because it can read obviously far faster than human can. The question we see with, across a whole range of areas is that these computer systems are often designed as advisory in the first instance. And then the juniors who come along and see their seniors using it and, and accepting the information that's been given, the advice that's been given, will say, I don't need to learn how to do the job myself in my head because I've got the computer here which will make the right decision every time. So, we go back to the 1950s, the 60s, the 70s, or well, my, my youth. When everybody around me said, oh, the computer just advises. Humans must make decisions. That really comes back to all of this. And yes, we can do training, whether neural network-based training or whatever. The question is, do we know what lesson that neural network has learned? There's a beautiful example from some years ago. The military, the American military, were busy trying to train their wizard machine to detect the difference between um, enemy and friendly tanks. And they gave a whole lot of training slot photos. And it was very, very reliable on the training data. The only problem was they discovered eventually, by experimentation, was it hadn't learned the right lesson. It had learned how to determine the difference between a forest and a nice sunny desert because of the way the training data, training photos, have been uh, given to them. So we always have to worry about what on earth the lessons those autonomous uh, neural networks and other technic technical systems are doing. We need to have what Watson Analytic, well, Watson Cognitive has, the ability to get it to tell us what it's doing and why it's doing. And that's one of the things about Watson Cognitive, is it actually gives you all of the reasons why it's making those decisions. For, or for those recommendations, probabilities and the different factors that have been considered. And we will need, if we want to avoid the sort of problems that we see in science fiction, we need to set those ground rules so that our learning systems can tell us why and what it is that they're learning. 
just a couple of little uh, ideas. We, we're used to using location services on these. We tag our photos. Those points there, or that curve, is showing how inaccurate and unstable these are. I was standing for 25 minutes, taking a photo every 30 seconds. And that's the, the main part of the movement. There was a slight problem on the startup. Before that, the first um, item on or photo on that was actually four kilometers out of straight out of place. And I have photos which are tagged anything up to 1,600 kilometers in error on the first photo. The next photos are okay, but that first one, so there's a lesson there for using GPS data. Another research project of my students shows that about 85% um, of the data collected by these gadgets for photos is within 25 meters, which for most purposes isn't too bad. The question is that other 15%, and particularly the last one and a half percent, which can be out as much as 50, 100 miles and worse. In the retail advertising to mobile uh, space, think near, point out that something like 12 or so percent of all of the directed adverts are, locate, are to locations which are more than 60 miles from where they think they're selling the adverts. That is a reputational risk, folks. Many of you will have seen this one about correlation versus causation. The perfect correlation, or near perfect correlation between tons of raw lemons imported into the USA from Mexico and the number of road deaths on the American, North American roads. Perfect correlation, it is very difficult to believe there is any form of um, causation behind that. Three books we all need to read. The first one is about insight. We're talking here about analytics, data analytics, and the internet of things. And we've mentioned insights, business insights. Barry Klein's book is a fascinating exploration of what this means, but the critical thing for today is at the end of it, he points out that many of our organizations claim to want insights. The trouble is, insights are disruptive, and most organizations like management for consistency. And insight being disruptive often get um, stamped on. So there's a really interesting challenge about what we need to do, particularly for those of you who are um, C-level uh, executives. Do you really want insights or is it lip service? And fight very, very closely to the end, do we have too much trust in our technology? Coming out of Gary Klein and Nick Carr, these various points are so important. The levels of de-skilling in our, our workforce, the lack of models in people's heads of understanding what's going on, are seen in various different industries. Just going back 30, 40 years to what the people of my peer group who were using slide rules had the head model of how things worked. The next generation just put data into that terminal, into that computer, a model that someone else had created for them, and out comes garbage because they didn't notice they put something in wrong. If they had done the work on the slide rule with a formula, they would have known what was wrong. And often, we know how to game the system. But for example, in the mortgage field, over the last 10, 12, 15 years, more and more of mortgage applications are handled entirely electronically by a computer at headquarters to get consistency. So you didn't have inconsistent uh, application of the rules. And so what happens today, the mortgage advisor said, oh, we know you, we like you, we want you to get a mortgage, so uh, what was it that you, we need to fill in here? And they would, sorry, they would feed you a question in a way that guaranteed you gave them the right answer, feed into that to a computer model that made sure you passed the compliance requirements to get that mortgage, and, vice versa, and many other areas. We know so often the systems are gamed so that we can achieve what we really want to achieve in spite of the rest of it. 
And if you think about the subprime mortgage problem, that system was being gained very, very heavily by the mortgage advisors based on the models which had been created because of many things, but that film there, all watched over by machines of loving grace, which you can get easily from Vimeo, explains the history of why we have become so reliant and so trusting unnecessarily and inappropriately in our technology. So, last little bit. My students have come up with 12 different words beginning with V, which allow you to ask yourself and your teams, your customers, your suppliers, Words beginning with V that help you to understand whether you are likely to have a successful project that will deliver you the value that you are hoping to get. It will help you to ask the question, who's going to get the value? And you need to think about the Standish Group report as well, the Chaos Report, because there are, there are some very, very good reports there that have come out over the last 22 years. And they will help you also to ask questions about the project management of your technology project, help you to make the right sort of decisions about setting them up. Because at the moment, something like 60% of all big data analytics type projects are failing. They're not delivering the expected value. So, and the other thing is to avoid, as Daniel Kahneman will put it, the planning fallacy. The question is, why are we going to be more successful this time than everybody else, or than we have been in the past? Do you know why you were successful? Do you know why you were not successful? And again, his book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is a really valuable book to understand how people think, how people work, and to understand what you should be doing to get more effective projects. Those are the V's, you can look them up later on. And at the end of the presentation, which is already up on my website, um, you'll be able to get the extra 12, 13 pages, which I'm not showing now, which take you through each of the V's that are up on that list. And then there's this little links here that will take you to where all of the uh, things are found. So thank you very much. Now switching hats as the sort of chair of the session, are there any questions? Hey, it is quite interesting what you mentioned, the three books. We also came up almost the same input part of the seed competence, required competence for data science. But it uh, looks like reading books is already for mature, mature specialists. How you can make this, uh, you cannot advise student to uh, read these books to become a data scientist. Uh, so how you can include this element equivalent to this book into a curriculum? We are thinking about this. Those books were there for you guys to read, not for my data scientists to, to read. Uh, those are my recommendations for three books which are absolutely valuable for any business leader who wants to use big data analytics. Um, yet yeah, they're also useful for students. Um, the students actually can't, I mean, you, you'd say you can't expect students to read. Well, I've got a lovely example from 10, 12 years ago when I started as an academic. I was in the lift in the university and there was a colleague, she was only little, she was French, and she was teaching um, English literature. And I had never seen a person so staggeringly angry. And it turned out that she'd set her students, finally her students, a short passage to read the previous week for the, the seminar that she just led. And one lass had clearly not done any reading of that passage. When challenged as to why she hadn't read the passage to prepare, she said as bluntly as this, I didn't come to university to read books. 
that has some significance today because we have the millennial generation and yes, they do not read books so much, they don't read so much. However, the way I teach my students, these guys will have had bibliographies against their 3,000 word articles that they've written there of anything from 10 to 50 sources. And there are a wide range of industry-based sources, academic sources and so on. So I don't think we have a problem ultimately, at least not the way I teach them, uh, and I get students of first year, first semester, where they're writing 1,500 word articles for our e-publications, and some of those are hitting to 20, 25 sources. Which for, given that most first year students struggle to get six sources in a bibliography, I think is not, not too bad. Um, they're, they're, I would, these sort of books there are not so much necessarily for data scientist students, there are sections in there that I would possibly point them towards, a chapter or a section. Any more questions? Yeah, you mentioned the, uh, the potential impact of juniors in an environment where the automated systems are in use and that they're perhaps likely to uh, be more trusting of those than, than to think that they'd rather see themselves as the experts in the future, so they may not be so inclined to learn the system. But I, well, the point I want to make is, is they're not a danger of the expert themselves becoming progressively lazier as the systems deliver ever more reliable results. And I'm thinking um, there's maybe even a, 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 a stronger reinforcing factor. If I think back to a plane crash that took place in 2002 uh, over Switzerland, where um, there was an automated system which warned the pilot of a potential collision, he was advised to override this by somebody of air traffic control, and that resulted in a fatal collision. So I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to think that air traffic controllers are more likely to trust the systems for fear of being held uh, liable uh, for not trusting the systems. An interesting set of questions that are all locked together about, first of all, the reliability, the verify, can we verify our systems? Because in my experience, we are, as humans, almost incapable of producing 100% perfect specifications. And that's partly because we don't have perfect memory, and partly for a lot of other reasons. We do not know how to reliably create software because unlike a physical system, if you think about a watch, you draw out the blueprints, give the material specifications, the right sort of brass or whatever, and you then give that each set of blueprints to a, say, 20 different competent um, watchmakers and they will produce identical watches within a Nats whisker. If you give a high-grade UML specification to 20 competent programmers, all competent in, say, C-sharp, the sake of argument, you will get 20 different packages of software. If it is of any significant size, it becomes really quite difficult to actually verify, first of all, the fact that those 20 different sets of software meet the spec. Secondly, it is well nigh impossible ahead of time to prove that the spec actually was correct in relation to what the user wanted. So the software we end up with, whether we use Agile or the sort of techniques we've got here, or the old waterfall system, we have enormous problems of being certain that the software actually does what it's supposed to do and that it does what the customer wanted it to do. And that's been a problem for 40 years that I've been involved. When we start getting into more and more complex, I mean, we know, for, take for example, just as an example we're probably all familiar with, Microsoft Word, over the last, what, 20 odd years just about, it's been developing through to its uh, version 10. It's had many, many changes to its interface and so on. And it has still not got rid of the problem if you highlight a chunk of text, Control B to make it go bold, 
And depending on what you've been doing, the whole of the um, document goes bold, and you have to then click on the undisclosed design feature, undo, <clears throat> and it undoes the boldness for everything except if you wanted to go. And part of the problem is, as they develop the software from version to version, from 16-bit uh, to 32-bit to 64-bit, they haven't re just rebuilt it cleanly from square one. They've just added stuff on, and so there are multiple paths through the software. And no one knows where those multiple paths are. And you don't know why it's choosing this path versus that path, not even the experts. And so we have more and more issues making it more and more difficult to be able to trust the software, among other things. And then you've got this laziness of humans, which I mean, fundamentally humans are lazy. That's just a fact about the human beings. If we can do things easily and quickly, we'll do it rather than putting the effort in. And so the de-skilling will happen both for the new ones coming through who don't see why they need to bother, because it does it for me, and as you say, the experts may well be slowly de-skilling as well, because I'm not going to, it's right every time so far, so why should I bother to check it against my mental model? And that, to me, is a really worrying uh, development. At least as worrying as thinking about what might happen as we go up that um, curve, that was your one, of the number of brains. That's as worrying, but you know, the, the fact that we're going to let ourselves de-skill. I mean, how many of us remember phone numbers now? When I was, before we had computers and had this thing, I remembered phone numbers really quite well. When I got this, or well, its predecessor, one of them, it took me about two years to remember what my phone number was that was on there. I still don't know what my wife's phone number is because I don't need to know it. It's on here. And as long as it's got plus four four in front of it, I can use it anywhere in the world. So I don't even need to worry about trying to remember what is the international access code for the USA, or in the USA, for the UK, or whatever. It all just happens. Why should I remember? Why should I expend effort to create in my head the mental model that makes us who we are? And we see again in Nichols Carr's book, using these devices for navigation could affect how our memories actually work, because that he says there's some interesting research which connects the way that our brain maps itself so we know how to get out over there. Now, we, many of us build a model when we come into a new place so that I know where the exit is. It's over there. Straight down there. And by building that, it helps our memory apparently. And if we, as we start using these devices and getting them to chatter to us, turn left, turn right, and so on, we lose that ability to build that map in our head, because I don't need to anymore. And as we build analytics that does more and more and more for us, if we have inaccurate data, and we don't know which is inaccurate by how much, can we really trust it without inspecting it ourselves as humans with those mental models to check for validity? Now, we know spreadsheets are interesting. Research has shown that something like 95% of all spreadsheets of any significant size have at least one significant error in them, which will probably change the judgment. And those are because you, know, you can't inspect the coding. From what you just uh, explained, uh, what Yuri explained, uh, I would deduce that uh, you would need uh, to a computer science curriculum a bit of science. Uh, a bit could be physical model, models for stability and instability, uh, stochastic modeling, some of it, Brownian motion, for instance, uh, random walk, knowing that it can uh, be uh, uh, going nowhere or going somewhere. And, and, and a bit of evolution science, which is uh, best embodied in, in biology, uh, to know where the evolution of your system might lead in the end, if, you, if you're not careful. And, and so you would 
we inject a little bit of non-digital know-how into a, a digital curriculum. That sounds an excellent idea. Are you making note of that one, Yuri? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's still recording over there, so we'll also get it recorded in a bit of luck, so we'll capture that thought now. Yeah, no, that's really useful, and we'll be in touch as well. So, yes, we also recommend uh, to, to, to increase the research methods in curriculum, and this was the first recommendation in US Wamsetam, the approach the project is based. We have four data science programs, and all of them accepted uh, the research method or business method as an important component of building more rather soft part of the competence for data scientists. And what also all program is uh, accepted is building probabilistic thinking, what is a major idea for me from the data. Uh, from Delia Kahneman to thinking fast and think, think slow, that human brain is not probabilistic, it's deterministic. So if we want to progress this our technology, we need to extend our brain specifically in this direction. And this is data science is doing this. So this is like, uh, yes, I know that this, and <laughs> all ideas that is, was told here, surely we will try to. And continue probably this Yeah, we'll be in touch on that one because I think there's a lot to develop here. I mean, the other thing is those who, not just the data science, you know, these are skilled people we're trying to develop in universities. But there's a very big problem, and that McKinsey report that, um, that Yuri was mentioning uh, shows that for every one data scientist that we need to create for you, there are probably already 10 people in your organization who so over the next three or four years are going to need to upskill somewhat to understand the value that data and numbers and so on can give your organization to understand both the capabilities and the limitations of things like analytics. Uh, because too many people think of IT and have done for many, many years IT is a magic silver pixie dust which you sprinkle lightly over a business problem and it magically evaporates. And at the moment, the significant signs looking at the Gartner height curve, for example, that analytics, the IoT, predictive analytics, etc., 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 are all on the height curve as being the magic pixie dust. And as we all know here, there is no real pixie dust anywhere, uh, let alone magic pixie dust. And so we need people to understand both the capabilities and the limitations at all levels of our organizations. If there are no further questions then, as chair of the track, I'd like to thank you very much for coming. Um, we've covered a lot of interesting topics from the two case studies this morning um, and the various other things we've been doing. Uh, looking at the what Yuri was covering in terms of the data science um, skills matrices that we need to develop. Uh, marketing from um, Peter Gench, that was a really fun one, I like that, there's uh, some lovely stuff there. And it's very serious as well, he presented it in a kind of light-hearted fashion, but the import of that, in, uh, the use of AI neural networks, has some very, very significant impact on governments, should we be doing these things, how should we be doing them, and the thing that came out of the target uh, predicting pregnancy or pregnant women was should they have even have done that work in the first instance, let alone then started targeting pregnant women with adverts and uh, voucher packs, which is what brought the sky down on top of them. So there are lots of things we can do, we need to ask ourselves, should we do them? And Peter showed us the sort of capabilities that are there, but that's why those V's are here. It's for you to ask those questions about how to go about doing it. And then we looked at had those uh, presentations from Sean and uh, Scott about the smart city and sensors and the way that they could be used for us. And we go all the way back then to uh, the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, uh, sorry, going backwards to the AstraZeneca. 
So we covered a lot of things today, a lot to think about. Uh, I think most of the presentation packs are going to be available through uh, the conference website. My presentation here is already available for you. Search for my computing.derby.ac.uk website as Richard Self Derby University on Google and then go part way down the page and you'll find uh, the slides and then tomorrow or on Friday you'll find the video there as well. Thank you very much ladies and gentlemen on behalf of uh, Connect365 as well, thank you for coming.